Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Friday, March 1st. Um, we just uh, celebrated the leap year. So uh, 29th, RK Equity just published our scoreboard and there was a lot of green shoots. So I'm calling this kind of like lithium leap year. Uh, we're gonna go through that just a little bit. There were a number of stocks like Wildcat was up 80% in one month and a number uh, of others that were up 20, 30, 40%. So, uh, you know, China futures, uh, Guangzhou futures have uh, gone crazy in the past two weeks post China New Year. Um, we have Matt Fernley on the program for, I don't know, the third or fourth time. I saw Matt most recently in November and uh, with Rodney at the one-to-one -one conference and we were commiserating and saying, what the hell did we you know, get wrong? When's like things gonna recover? And Matt, and, and we agreed that, you know, we, nothing would happen until kind of Chinese New Year and then fingers crossed, you know, post China New Year, things would get better. So here we are, they are getting better. Uh, don't know what we're gonna call this yet, but uh, we had Matt on the program uh, when lithium prices were quite high and we said, you know, how high can the lithium price go? Uh, so maybe we'll put that question to Matt. Uh, but we also had him on as they were falling in uh, March of last year. And we labeled it after a Tom Petty free falling. Uh, and he, he rightly called with Rodney a, a bounce, you know, which we had, uh, like nearly an 80% bounce, um, before, you know, falling aggressively, you know, in the September, whatever, in the, 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 the August to, you know, December period. Uh, so Matt just published his yearbook, uh, the battery materials review yearbook. And, uh, Rodney wrote a piece for that. Uh, and Matt, uh, we would all encourage you, this is free, you know, no such thing as a free lunch, but you know, this is free. There so is a free year. Yeah. Not just about lithium, but also graphite, nickel and other battery materials. So Matt's been a great analyst and puts a lot of information, you know, in the public domain, uh, for free and, uh, obviously has some other paid for, uh, you know, products, which we would encourage you to subscribe to, but, um, yeah, before we get into that, just want to remind everybody of our sponsor, Lithium Royalty Corp, uh, you know, ticker symbol LIRC on the Tor Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm heading to PDAC on Sunday. Look forward to catching up with Ernie Ortiz, the CEO. Current market cap of uh, LIRC is about $370 million. They have royalties on mostly hard rock uh, companies, including Sigma and Winsome Resources. Uh, you know, just check that out and we'll have a bit more, you know, later in the program about them. And, uh, Again, if you uh, are not getting our uh, lithium ion bull directly into your email box, please you know, register your email at rkequity.com. And uh, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe and, and comment. You know, let us know in the comments below. Uh, do you like Matt? You like what he's saying? You know, what other kind of guests um, do you think we, we should have? Do you agree with what he's saying? Um, and uh, also as a reminder, all of these videos are available in audio format on Spotify, Apple, and other podcast platforms. Uh, you could follow Rodney and me on X at Rodney Hooper 13 and me at Lithium Ion Bull. And Matt Fernley, you're at, at Review Battery, I think is your handle. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, I post mostly on LinkedIn these days, but I do occasionally post on X. Okay. Um, that's right. And you were you're talking about your LinkedIn post. So for a, a, a lot of last year and the year before you were arguing, we were arguing that, you know, mining can't catch up to, you know, battery and EV, you know, you had these unconstrained and constrained models where, you know, EV take up was not going to hit those models because you would have an undersupply of battery materials. So here we are, we've mentioned this before, um, you know, forecasts that Rodney put forth like five years ago, three years ago, you know, battery demand has exceeded by a lot, you know, what he was forecasting back then, but supply actually did manage to keep up in lithium, you know, and then in nickel and cobalt, you know, so they're ha like prices of batteries are going down heading toward, you know, $50 a kilowatt hour. So in lithium, we have talked, I mean, uh, about we got wrong, you know, uh, China lipidolite, uh, you know, it, supply, we didn't know. And some people are saying, you know, the cost of that is less than we, you know, estimated, you know, African, you know, DSO and, and, and other things, um, you know, have come on the market faster, Zimbabwe in particular, 
And, uh, and then there was a lot of battery destocking, right? You know, um, th these are the causes. That's what we got wrong. And now we're getting some signs that, you know, we don't know in China, you know, maybe curtailments, the West is curtailing a little bit. We don't really have a line of sight on Africa. I read a research report yesterday, you know, out of a China broker that, uh, is waiting for the Chinese companies to put out their you know, half yearly results so they can get some sense of actually what's happening in Africa. They have a better sense of what's happening on China Lapidolite, but no line of sight on, on that, on that. If you have any line of sight, Matt, you know, please share that. Yeah. And also on the battery destocking. I mean, you have a great partner, oh, yeah. Cormac Olaire, uh, who's based in China. We listen to, you also have a great podcast, the recharge podcast, which we, which we listen to monthly. It's also chock full of uh, great information, but I, I find that Cormac is very plugged into what's happening in China. So yeah, with that, um, how, how are you seeing things, you know, at, at the moment, um, based on what yeah. I said, and then Rodney will go into his more detailed questions after that. Okay. So, I mean, I, I think you, you, uh, relatively well recapped what we got wrong, uh, last year. I think one of the key things that we got long wrong last year was that we didn't realize how much inventory had been built in the supply chain. So China brought forward a lot of demand into the back end of 2022. Um, and that lithium demand didn't go into lithium inventories. It, it went, went into cathode inventories and, and battery inventories in China. So it didn't show up on an, you know, an obvious study of lithium inventories in China. We, we were, we saw, you know, 20, 25 days of supply and that looked absolutely fine. Where it did show up was when you started to analyze what the contained lithium was in cathode inventories and in cell inventories. And, you know, that's, that's what we have been keeping a very close eye on over the last six to 12 months. And the good news is that they're starting to fall again, particularly in the cathode space. Um, so that's great. But I, I think it sort of emphasizes again that in this industry, you don't have to just look at the supply and first use demand markets, you have to look all the way along the battery supply chain. And, and that makes it very different to the sort of industries we've looked at before, whereby, you know, if you compare that with the copper industry, you look at copper supply and you look at, you know, the first end user of copper demand and that's fine. And, and then the copper goes out of the industry and, and, and doesn't go in the inventories, but with this in industry because the supply chain is so long, um, both in length and in distance and, and time duration, um, it's very important to keep an eye on inventories all the way along the supply chain. And, and that's what we learned last year. Um, having said that the situation looks better now, and we're starting to see a destocking taking place, certainly in midstream inventories and to some extent in cell inventories and the thing that we're sort of keeping an eye on now is whether we will get a restocking in cathodes and in lithium for cathode makers, um, after Chinese new year. And, and if we think back to what happened last year, it was very seasonal and we saw that restocking in March and April, and that was what drove the lithium price recovery last time round. Um, so that, that's very much been our, our basis. That's been very, very much my basis for what I expected to see in 2024. Uh, and so far touch wood, um, that has come to pass. The big question, and I'm sure we'll get onto it later is how long that lasts for. Um, and then moving on to your other question in terms of supply, um, that's a really interesting story slash question. Um, my sort of 25 year career now as a commodity and materials analyst. Um, it's always paid to be long of those materials of which China is short and short of those materials of which China is long. You know, initially our view was that China was short of lithium. Um, but China's played a little bit of a blinder over the last two or three years. First of all, with lipid light and secondly, going around the blocks, um, that were placed on, on Chinese investment in Australia and in North America to invest in hard rock assets in Africa. Um, and you know, just to, to sort of come back to that brine assets take a long time to develop, uh, a lot of capital costs to develop. 
Um, so we had pretty good visibility as to, to what was going on in the brine assets in Latin America. Um, and there were a number of Chinese owned projects down there. The Chinese are, are, are bonged out from investing in Australia, um, by the Australian government and they're bonged out from investing in North America. Um, so the only other region that, that China Inc can invest in really that that's got resources is, is Africa and, uh. By God, they've invested a lot in Africa and it really came in from left field and, and it really caught us sort of unawares. Um, and if you look at, you, you know, where I see a lot of supply coming over the next three, four, five years, a lot of it's in Africa. And, you know, one of the things that became very clear to us over the last two or three years is, you know, lithium bearing pigmentites, they're not rare. Um, so, you, you know, you find them a lot in, in geologically active regions and Africa has a lot of very geological, geologically active regions. However, it then becomes a semi bulk material and you have to think about projects in terms of one, ore body size, two, availability of infrastructure, three, mineralogy and four management. So, you know, all of those factors now. Uh, come into focus when you look at investing in hard rock projects. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, small projects that you can get into production straight away for the future infrastructure and mineralogy and size uh, and therefore operating costs are going to be absolutely key, I think. So yeah, China, China's really played a blinder in terms of, of supply. And then the big question and the other question that you asked me about lipidolite, what are the operating costs? Um, that is a very interesting question. And my view is that operating costs are being widely underestimated in the market. We initially, when we went into that, um, assess on the Chinese lipidolite, um, thought that operating costs would be around $25 a kilogram. I believe that all in operating costs are still around $25 a kilogram. And I know levels of 10 to $15 a kilogram have been quoted by some brokers. And I think those are mine gate operating costs for currently operating lipidolite mines in China. But one of the things that's very interesting is currently about 50 to 70% of lipidolite operations in China are idled. They're not operating at current prices because they're not making money at current prices. So there's that to bear in mind. Those are higher cost operations and they are not, not profitable at current levels. So they're not operating the lower cost operations. I think the big question is what is included in those costs are, is it just mining and processing or is waste management including those costs? And what's come very clearly out of some of the reports that have come out over the last couple of weeks about the Chinese environmental checks is that waste management may not be included in those costs. And given that, you know, you're, you're, you're producing, I think something like 20 to 30 tons of waste per ton of lithium carbonate, when you process lipidolite, that's a lot of waste management. And I think the other thing to be aware of is a lot of the consultants in China who are looking at these, these, um, segments are not mining people. So they're not aware that, you know, once, when you start mining a, um, a pegmatite body, um, you'll have almost a zero stripping, uh, ratio, but as you mine deeper and deeper, you're mining more and more waste and therefore your operating costs go up. Um, so they're not looking at costs through the cycle. They're looking at what costs are for the first year, 18 months of that project. And I think we have to be aware that mining costs and processing costs will increase over time. So I'm pretty happy with my $25 per kilogram long run cost for, for lipidolites in China. And there that then impacts my long run, uh, long-term price forecast for, for lithium over the medium to longer term. Rodney looks doubtful. He's going to, no, I, I think, I next. think that's, that's a great Matt, because those are my sort of numbers. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been, I mean, I guess everyone, I, I suppose the thing we've been struggling with when analyzing all of this is how some brokers and banks are suggesting that lipidolite can grow 
as a, a you know, production in, in this sort of price environment, when you've got Swadjaman producers with much higher grade struggling. So it doesn't really sort of stack up. Um, not to mention if you're having environmental issues at this level of production, how are you meant to get to three and a half to four times this volume in the next yeah, I mean, few I, years? I, I, I don't have three and a half to four times in my model. I have, um, volumes growing maybe twice from where they are currently. Um, and I think I regard that lipidolite capacity in China or the bulk of that lipidolite capacity that's non-integrated in China as a, um, how would you call it as a high price solution? A... So, so it'll come in when prices go high. And it'll drop out when prices go low, similar to what we've seen in the Chinese iron ore industry. But you've raised, you've raised an interesting thing though, Matt. And here's the thing is, you know, is it possibly that there was some gamesmanship in terms of using excess inventory, lipidolite, et cetera, to get to the point to allow a lot of mass exploration into Africa to try and get some projects going there as the bigger, longer term threat to oversupply i've heard a lot of conspiracy theories cited in the in the sector i'm not a big believer in conspiracy theories I, it's I've, not a conspiracy yeah. theory what i'm saying is it's a strategy you you fill a stop gap and then you you know the idea was in my mind the new sigma lion town uh covalent were all coming on so you know that that material has to come on the question is where does the price get set if everyone's moving to market reference, uh, when they started. So, you know, you weren't starting an elevated price. We're now but starting at a much more sober level. I don't, I don't think that the lipidolite expansion, I mean, obviously some lipidolite expansion was done by large players, but an awful lot of it is mum and pop operations. It's basically taking advantage of the fact that prices were high. Um, so yeah. I don't think it was, you know, a centralized plan to come on and do that. Um, I, I think they did it taking advantage of a, a, of a known occurrence because the prices were high and because demand for lithium from the Chinese property market was weak. So, you know, they basically re reset that supply. And, and obviously the other issue that we hear about time and time again in lipidolite is the, um, so-called inter integrated suppliers like BYD and CATL, which have their own captive mines. And obviously the thinking there is, well, they don't really care how low the price goes because, because they're integrated. But at the end of the day, if I'm BYD or CATL and I can buy material in the market for $10 a kilogram and it costs me $20 a kilogram or $25 a kilogram to run my mine, surely I'm going to buy the material in the market for $10 a kilo rather than, than running my mine. So I'm not fully sold on the idea that you know, the, the captive mines, um, continue to run, even though, you know, prices crater, but I think, you know, I do see a different level of the marginal cost of production now to what the marginal cost of production may be in the industry in five years or six years or so, uh, which will be materially higher. And I think that people have to be aware of the fact that there's been some quite serious inflation um, in operating costs in China and will continue to be, if they have to start looking at, at managing their waste material, um, over time. So, you know, I, I, I see a situation now where we got obviously hit the marginal cost of production. Um, but similarly, you know, it's not to say that this will always be the marginal cost of production in lithium. I mean, if you think about it, the marginal cost of production in 2020, we bounced off what, $400 a ton spot con prices. Um, so the, the marginal cost of production then was much, much lower. Um, and it's, it's risen because new projects have had to come on, which were lower grade or higher cost. Uh, and I think it will continue to rise over the next four or five years. Um, and, and so will the sort of, uh, low price level in the market. Jumping in here from the editing room to tell you about lithium royalty corp. Lithium Royalty Corp is at the center of a global energy transition and manages a globally diversified portfolio of lithium-focused royalties in electrification and decarbonization. 
with 32 royalties on 29 higher grade, lower cost projects from exploration to production, LIRC covers all the bases with well-managed risk, ESG considerations, and a scalable royalty structure. Lithium Royalty Corp is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange ticker symbol LIRC. To find out more, visit lithiumroyaltycorp.com. Just on the flip side of that, uh, Matt, you know, one of the things, of course, $80 a kilo did is open Pandora's box for supply. Where do you think a sort of quick response at what price do you think it gets sort of capped on the upside now that you've, you know, introduced new operations and, and potential suppliers at short notice? So where do I think the new supplier is going to come from? The new cap. Where do you think, you know, where we'll run into, you know, the market being able to respond quicker in, in, in supplying? At well, I think price? that the lipid like supply would be able to come on um, within three to six months once prices get to sort of $20, $25 a kilo. So I think, you know, that would be a buffer down. for margin. Historically, not so much in China. Um, you know, my, my experience of, of, uh, looking at China in some detail is that you don't necessarily get that margin buffer if it's on a restart, um, uh, you know, a, a new startup maybe, but, but on a restart, probably not. So I, I think probably, you know, I'm looking at, at, at prices to sort of what's, um, rise by 60, 70% off, off the levels they're at, um in um just before chinese new year in february okay so if we can just go back to the yearbook congrats that must have been a labor of love um yes can you highlight in there some incontrovertible truths that investors should be that investors might be overlooking as we go into 2024 what is where sure. is uh where are the where's the reality check for everyone okay well i think um I think actually there's lots of, of those situations, but maybe I'll pick out four of them in particular from the yearbook. I think the most important one, um, when it comes to calling the lithium price is you've got to pay attention to the Chinese spot market and, and Chinese futures prices. And, you know, a number of commentators have suggested it's just noise in the market. Um, but over the last six months, it clearly hasn't been noise in the market. The Chinese future prices have led um, the the normal lithium prices, uh, the one month lithium prices, the fast market prices, the Shanghai metals market prices, etc. Um, and there's a reason for that. If I look at the CME futures market, the open interest is tiny. I mean, fine, it's bigger than it used to be, and it's coming up nicely, and and that's great. If I look at the open interest on the on the GFX, which is the yeah, China future, huge. it's huge. It's about probably 10 to 15% of the market size at the moment. So for me, that's a relevant market and you've got to start paying attention to that. Um, so I think it's really important within the, uh, uh, the yearbook. I also did a, a comparison of how much of the market now is exposed to spot prices and how much of the market is exposed to contract prices. And I think, you know, probably 60% of the market now is exposed to spot prices. And you've, you've got to be aware of the impact that that has on spot prices and therefore it has on contract prices, because as the contract price situation is changing, all of the producers really are going to one month contracts rather than quarterly contracts. Um, what the spot price in China is doing is very, very important. And anybody who tells you it isn't, I'm afraid is living in the past. So you've got to keep an eye on what the, the GFX, um, price is doing in China. Um, the second point I would make, um, which is very important to lithium in particular, um, is DLE, um, direct lithium extraction, um, has been mooted as the new technology in lithium, uh, really for the last seven or eight years. Um, it hasn't emerged yet. I'm not saying it won't emerge, but what I am saying is that a number of the early stage producers in 2018, 2019, are now a lot further along on the development curve. And one of the incontrovertible proofs and certainties 
is that as they have got further along on the development curve, um, their assessments for how much these projects will cost have risen by 100 to 150%. So let's be realistic. DLE may very well be the answer to lithium supply, but not at the sort of capital intensities that are being quoted by junior companies. And I think it's really important that investors and junior company managements a little bit more realistic about estimating what the capital and operating costs are of these projects, because let's face it, a number of these projects wouldn't have got away if they had, um, how does one put it? If they had known that the capital costs would be as high then as they do now. So I think investors have to have to look at these projects in a little bit more detail and put a bit of a contingency cost on because I don't think junior management teams are correctly estimating what the capital intensity of these projects are. So I think that that's a key takeaway. So those are my, my takeaways on lithium. Um, I have one really important takeaway on the industry. Um, and, and that is that I think that the bulk of sell side analysts and US sell side analysts in particular are too conservative on EV sales in 2020 from 2025. And I understand looking at the EV market in the US um, and looking at the results for Tesla and GM and Ford, which are all, well, GM and Ford, which are hemorrhaging cash uh, and Tesla, which hasn't been doing as well as it, as it has been doing previously, that you could look at that and come to the conclusion that the EV market is weak, but it's not. And in China in particular, growth is pretty robust. Um, and there's another area that a lot of analysts are not picking up, which is the rest of the world. So the world ex Europe, ex China and the US. And in 2020, we sold 200,000 EVs in the rest of the world. And in 2023, we sold over a million EVs. And by the end of 2024, the rest of the world will be bigger than the US as an EV selling region and it's growing. Well, new year, someone rapidly. else is, is selling this, they're doing the same story. And the reality is Matt, is if you look at the production estimates for the U S for the Chinese auto companies, excess outside of China is going to go to rest of world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, the, the Chinese are very active in the, in the rest of the world. I'm not necessarily talking about Europe. I'm talking about countries like. Uh, Thailand, and it's like everything Indonesia. outside of, of, of those three. I mean, I have rest of world bigger than Europe by about 2027. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really, really important. And, and I think, you know, if it, I, I read a lot of US sell side stuff and people have got EV sales globally up 0%, down 5%, up 5%, you know, maybe up 10% for, for this year. It's not going to be that bad. And I, I, you know, the other, um, Sorry, what do you have it at, uh, Matt? Your I number. have it at twenty-eight percent year-on-year growth rate, and I was I was thirty-five percent last year, which was actually bang on. Um, I, I have a bit of a slowdown in in Europe and and the US, and sort of about the same in China, and acceleration in the rest of the world. Um, but I think the other thing that we have to be aware of, and maybe we'll talk about it later on, which is very important also in terms of forecasting lithium demand, is the plug-in hybrid. Uh, to be EV ratio, and that is has changed substantially over the last year. Um, but I won't mention that now. And then the final point that I would make that I think investors have to be aware of is that a lot of the easy money has been made in this sector. We had an up market basically from September 2020 till uh, what the end of 20, you know, that was what two years. I think now cycles in this sector will be much shorter. So uh, I think that a lot of the easy money has been made. We have to be much more aware of, of what cycles are doing and cycles are going to be governed by what inventories are doing. So it's really, really important that, that investors keep an eye on inventory positions, um, at raw material producers, at cathode makers, um, and in the cell and EV supply chains. Um, and, and, you know, these are, 
these are data points we publish on a monthly basis in, in battery materials review, but they allow you to understand where prices are going. Um, and I, I think increasingly we have to keep an eye on those sort of cycles. So things like the marginal cost of production are going to be absolutely key. And, you know, by knowing what the marginal cost of production is, you, you called the bottom in the cycle. Um, but also knowing, you know, what inventory cycles are looking like, you can call when, when prices are about to pick up and therefore equities, and also when, when prices and equities are about to top out as well. So the four, that fourth takeaway, um, cycles are the easy money has been made, but well, the, the easy money is over the long you, term. You're, you're so, about you, know, you can't buy and hold over two years now. What I'm saying is you, you have to hold over shorter periods. You the, have to trade. Long -term, the long, the long-term investor in lithium is a, is a mugs game. You need to trade. Um, I mean, if, if you're happy to buy. And, and then, you know, not worry about the fact that your position could halve, you know, and, and then pick up in five years time, then that's fine. But if, if you're worried that your position could halve in the interim, then yeah, you need to trade around a lot more. Right. Okay. I mean, I've been doing lithium for 15 years and, um, you know, I thought this was lithium 3.0, you know, I, I called it almost famous lithium 2.0, which was the. 2016 to 2018 period. Yeah. And, and I thought, you know, lithium decade, you know, we would not have this pullback. And I, I I've been reluctant. I, I debated with Rodney, whether or not I should say lithium 3.0 ended and now we're in lithium 4.0. Um, I just want to say that this was a, you know, a blip still within lithium 3.0, but you know, maybe it's not, but, uh, look, uh, the, the scoreboard shows that it, there was, it was easy money. If you bought just, you know, just before the, uh, at the beginning of the month. Right. Yeah. And, uh, it, 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 or the panic of, uh, January, because there was definitely a panic when the spodrine price, you know, decreased, you know, by 28% to catch up to the carbonate price Yeah, because everyone moved to the monthly pricing, right. Had you, um, I panic sold some stocks to be honest, you know, at that point, which I, I should have done in December. Uh, but I have bought back, you know, I bought back some, you know, I sold some Piedmont at 26. I bought back Piedmont at 14. Right. Um, I bought lithium Argentina, um, recently, you know, liquid names, uh, they have cash, uh, and they're in production. Um, I know those stories like pretty well. So I, I think they're mispriced, but, uh, but you're right. If they suddenly kind of like double, you know, in, uh, in a short period of time, then y you should take some profits off the day because that, that, so a question I had here is, um, is this a V-shaped recovery? Is this a, a, a W, you know, or is it a square root, right? Or is it some other yeah. um, shape? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, and so obviously we've had the run up now in the last week or so because of the environmental inspections in China, but we haven't actually had a fundamental increase in demand. So everybody's, a number of analysts are out there in the market suggesting that um, cathode production will re-accelerate. And if that happens, then we should have a restocking event, but it hasn't happened yet. So the big question is, is this a square root or is it a V? And it could be a V if the cathode production activity comes in quickly enough before the em environmental inspection activity peters out. Did that make sense? I'm, uh, I'm not very good with my shapes, but, uh, if, um, so we could get a, a, a square root in so far as if the, if the Chinese lithium inspection activity peters out, then we might have a correction and then a recovery when the, uh, actual fundamental demand from the cathode makers, uh, starts to, starts to kick in probably in the second half of March. But I think the other, the other reason why we've had this big move in stocks is obviously a lot of these stocks were heavily shorted. And we've had a bit of a short covering rally here. So the, the big question is, will the short covering rally peter out and we get a bit of a correction back down again, or will the demand from the cathode makers move in and support the price? And it just is a V-shaped recovery. I don't know. It's, it's, inter <laughs> it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Yeah. A, a company like uh, Pilbara though, which had like 20% short 
based on the total quantum versus their market cap, I think that's like 20 or 30 days of trading, mm -hmm. you know, for that to kind of go to zero. Not that it would go to zero. There'll always be some short. Yeah. But we're only like, you know, day five into it. So in terms of if it's just a short covering rally, you probably still have a, a couple more, you know, weeks to go. Well, um, I and, mean, Pilbara yeah. in particular is trading about double its average daily volume at the moment. So we are mm -hmm. seeing big volumes, which suggests we are seeing, you know, some element of, of short covering and particularly the Australian stocks. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really don't know um, what we will see you know, over the next couple of weeks. Just what do you, uh, um, wants to sort of, you know, you've left that kind of open-ended, but what I was going to ask you, Matt, is where, you know, where across the industry do you see the best value at the moment? Is it in the exploration? Is it in the development or is it in the producers? That's a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> Um, thank we you so much for that. Me. Duck with me. Uh, we want an answer. Yeah. I see a number of the high cost producers as being um, the best value at the moment. I'm not going to name names because I, I don't talk about stocks. But I think if you look at some of the really high cost producers out there, you know. So if leveraged. You at, if you look at operating rev leverage, if you go from being loss making to being profit making, um, then the EPS impact is very substantial. So you will see, you know, those sort of producers, uh, do very well. Generally in the last lithium cycle, we also saw the developers, um, particularly the near term developers do very well off, off the increase in price. Um, I've been a big supporter of the explorers over the down cycle. My gut feeling is that the highly leveraged producers and the near-term developers will do better than the explorers um, over the next little bit. Um, obviously, with the caveat that you flagged Wildcat at the beginning of this call that did 80%. So, I, Well, I, 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 pa Patri Patriot and Winsome are, have rallied strongly too. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know, but my gut feeling is, this, is if this becomes a sustained recovery, um, then I think that the, um, the highly leveraged or the high cost producers and the near term developers should do very well. Um, because I think they've been oversold substantially oversold. But we, we, we think you have to look at the cash balances as well, because there's severe dilution risk, um, for companies that, uh, that might be good quality, but you know, um, they have to kind of weather the cycle. I mean, yeah. dilution risk is, you know, is evident in something like. Piedmont, you know, in Siano, which is in early construction, but it's also for a, uh, an exploration company that may have raised, you know, 5 million or $8 million last year, you know, in James Bay, they weren't able to drill so much, but like, like, um, if they get good, if they have a couple of drill holes and good ex, you know, good results, they're going to seek to raise money. Like there's, there's going to be a window of, 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 yeah. of capital raises. Like there was post battery day. I remember I was keeping track as you were keeping track of all the capital raises, you know, early to you guys, isn't it? I had a question on you. You said, the U S analysts are underestimating EV demand. Uh, we noticed in Albemarle, uh, lowering for the first time in four years, their lithium demand numbers for 2030, uh, they, they blamed kind of like slower EV, but if you look at their charts, like their ESS number was very small, right? You know, so Rodney has been outlier bullish on ESS. Do, did you make any comment in the battery materials review? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Especially if, uh, costs, you know, are, are going down close to $50 a kilowatt hour. I mean, I, I've been tracking ESS very closely as well, and I'm, I'm just as excited as Rodney about it. And I think, you know. Um, I mean, just to give you a data point, China, um, put on more solar power in 2023 than the rest of the world put together. And it put on, I think 10% as many gigawatts of ESS. So there's a lot of latent demand in China for ESS. There's a lot of solar capacity going on around the world, wind as well, to a lesser extent. Um, so I think, you know, I've always said that ESS is going to grow faster um, than EVs, but obviously it's off a lower base, um, but it will start to become impactful by the second half of this decade. 
um, in terms of lithium demand, in terms of, um, of cell demand in the big picture. So yeah, I, I think that's very relevant to it. One other the, question. But... I think the, the, the issue, I mean, I, I, I don't want to put words into Albemarle's mouth, but I think that the, um, perhaps the issue of the lower lithium demand, um, has something to do with the huge takeoff in plug-in hybrids in China. Um, because we have seen the PHEV to BEV ratio increase quite substantially in China over the last 12 to 14 months or so. And obviously your average plug-in hybrid has 50% smaller battery in China, um, but actually a, a, a 70% smaller battery than the average BEV in Europe and the US. So yes, um, I, I think, you know, that's one of the that's one of the key things that we have to be aware of when we're tracking, um, when we're tracking lithium demand, you know, even though we're, we're selling a large amount of EVs, a, a greater proportion of the EVs we're selling in China are, are PHEVs. Okay. That, that, great. But my other question that just came to mind, you, you've been a China watcher for a very long period of time, uh, and, and mining analyst, you know, and, and I'm looking at what's happening, you know, in the EV space and the battery space and China had this made in China 2025 plan announced nine years ago. And just looking through the prism of batteries and EVs, it was a great industrial policy. They're winning, you know, they're kicking America's ass, Europe's ass, right? Like it's crazy, but broadly. You know, the Chinese stock market has been weak for five years. You know, th th there's real estate, you know, problems. Um, th there's demographic problems, like, like outside of the, the, the narrow prism of lithium electric vehicles and batteries, the China narrative is not so great. And we're all kind of waiting. Oh, well, they'll just stimulate again and they'll just stimulate it. And, uh, you know, and I also look at the iron ore price and the iron ore price has been pretty resilient. So I'm just. You're watching China maybe more broadly, if you can kind of give I mean, us a sense of, um, I mean, that, because if, if China's running right, you know, then broadly, right. Mm. then commodities broadly could run if China, if commodities broadly are running, you know, lithium might rise with that broader commodity. Mm. I, I, yeah, I mean, to go back to the Chinese economy, I mean, obviously property has been moribund for the last two years. Um, and you know, historically, uh, property has been a major driver of of commodities demand in China, uh, particularly copper. Yet copper, copper demand in China was up 10% year on year last year. And why was copper demand in China up 10% year on year? Because of the renewables building. Um, but I think what you're seeing in China, and it's something that, that a lot of Western commentators can't quite get their head around is you are still seeing the political move from a fixed asset investment driven economy to a domestic consumption driven economy and Western commentators are still looking for them to, to come around and stimulate the property market and stimulate fixed asset investment. And it's just not going to happen in the way it happened in 2007, 2008. So they are stimulating in the soft way around domestic consumption and they want their economy to move to a situation where it's being driven by domestic consumption, like the Western world economies do. And, and that's actually really supportive of EVs because you've got this huge domestic industry and you have the consumers there in China. So there is the potential for Chinese industrial production to reaccelerate this year. Like in the Western world, there are signs that it troughed in the back end of, of 2023, um, but it's not going to be a like it has been in, in previous years, it's going to be a, a gradual recovery. And just on the other macro point of view, in terms of the, the wider market, I do think that, um, European and us, uh, IP will recover this year. And one of the big drivers is that, that I see is business inventory restocking cycle, uh, which should be positive for demand in, in manufactured goods. Uh, we may very well see the long awaited infrastructure build out, uh, in the U S and in Europe, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, we've been waiting for that for nigh on 20 years and it still hasn't quite, uh, occurred. So we'll, we'll wait and see if it does, but I do think the business inventory restocking cycle and, um, the IP cycle will be a bit stronger in the second half of the year. 
and that could feed into other parts of the battery raw materials complex. Okay. Anyway, Matt, always a pleasure. Um, thanks again. Encourage every viewer here to uh, follow Matt on LinkedIn uh, and download this battery materials review. Listen to his recharge podcast with Cormac Allaire. Uh, lots of great information there. Always love having you on the program, Matt, and um, exchanging thoughts. Thanks for the invite. Good to talk to you guys always.